Welcome to my 100 subscriber video. I first want to thank everyone that has subscribed and helped me to reach 100 subscribers, whether that is in the very beginning or recently or anywhere in the middle. I thank everyone who subscribed and is helping me out. I really appreciate it. I'm going to have a lot more videos coming out. I took a little break. I've been working on a lot of things, but I assure you I'm going to have a lot of videos coming out. I have a whole lot of ideas and videos already ready just to record basically. So in this video, I'm going to be a little more relaxed. I'm going to talk about a lot of musical things and a few other things as well, just talking about self-care and life and stuff like that. So first of all, I want to talk about classical music and rock, why I love both of these very different genres of music so much, and they're almost polar to each other. They're completely different genres. And why do I love these genres so much, and why do some weeks I will listen to only classical music? And some weeks or some days I only listen to rock music and I'm kind of getting that feeling some days it's both who knows but I think a lot of the reason for this is how I grew up I grew up with a lot of interesting bands for example electric light orchestra is one of them moody blues and even the Beatles one thing in common with a lot of these groups is that they do rock music and they also have orchestra parts in their rock music whether it's going with it or even some of these groups will have certain songs that will basically be an orchestral song with or with not singing. It's the fact that it's a rock oriented band and you hear this orchestral music. I was always influenced by this and I was always profoundly affected like wow. And growing up studying more music, I started realizing that some of the most beautiful or some of the most better said, some of the most moments that kind of touch my soul that touch me deep down I'm like wow that's gets me in the feels I've noticed those songs for me have the strings it's basically most of the time I think that's a very deep song very meaningful song to me and I find out oh, it has a violin in it throughout it or it has a just maybe it's kind of like string quartet and start noticing that a lot more that I pay attention to it okay so that it's pretty interesting there's also people like Van Morrison Neil Diamond David Bowie even Pink Floyd, Grateful Dead, and even Queen have some songs with some orchestral parts. For example, David Bowie's Low Album, you get some sort of contemporary and experimental orchestral music in there. Pink Floyd's Adam Hart Mother, same kind of deal, maybe not as contemporary, not as experimental, but you get your orchestral music. Grateful Dead, Terrapin Station, you get some string parts and stuff, you get some wind instruments and stuff and some brass, so you get all that percussion as well and then queen the song who wants to live forever there's other examples of queen as well but that one is powerful you have strings in it you have the cello you have violins and then i noticed that song was always very powerful to me which leads me to the next thing is actually voices in music but not just voices in music but used as harmony it's almost when you take a voice like a singer's voice and you use it like an instrument would to harmonize or build a note in the chord of the song that's happening at the moment. So with that, to live, Who Wants to Live Forever by Queen, I always wondered why it was so powerful to me, and I heard someone say it was a composer that some of the most powerful moments in music, one thing in common is that they have voices harmonizing with everything. Like, ah, and it adds a certain depth and effect to it that is very powerful, okay? If you actually look at that music video too, you see a whole choir section, at, especially at the end, singing with them. It's a very powerful moment. And then you go to rock groups, Toto, Journey, stuff like that. They do a lot of things where even the singers, the other players in the band will harmonize with the lead singer, adding some background harmony. And again, it's that very powerful sound. Later, rock bands implemented this more when you started going more into the late 80s and 90s rock and that became more of an average thing and then that leads me to not just voices used as harmony in a piece but voices used in a piece like we have modern singing today well, where does that come from and well it comes from a lot of places the very first music was literally our voices in church from what our records show just ah uh, singing one note at a time and known as plain chant, okay? But fast forward way to there, further than that, there's a certain period of time where some well-known composers, conductors, or maestros at the time, all got together and said, we want this idea, we want to create an opera, 
and they didn't, I don't know if they had a name for it yet, but they had this idea where they'd have this group of symphony playing together, they'd have these singers, and they'd create basically what we know of as an opera. And they, this was a profound idea, and it changed the course of music. So, opera, that's kind of the topic what I'm talking about right now in this section. Opera is something that not your average person's really into. I wasn't really into it. I would hear all the, ah, and, you know, some of the more intense kind of sounding operas, or maybe some of the not so nice sounding operas. And I think, like most people, that steered me away from it. And I thought, that's not my type of music. I am not into that. But then I started thinking about it more. I, I know someone personally who really likes operas, and they love operas. Like, it puts them, like, almost seems like into a trance, and I wondered why they liked it so much. And so I started digging into operas myself, and I started realizing something is that a lot of these well-known famous operas that people love are in a different language than English. I speak English, I don't speak multiple languages, so there's a sort of disconnect there. And I realized this one day that if I don't realize what the singers are saying, then they might be singing all these, they might be saying all these things. And if I understood what they're saying, maybe I would understand why they're singing the way that they are more, okay? So then that lead me to, led me to watching my first opera with actual subtitles and reading it, which was Wagner's Rheingold, the first of the Rings series, the four, forget exactly what that's called, Das, I don't want to say it exactly, but it was Wagner's works, four works that comprise uh, three four hour pieces and one I think it's three and a half hour piece. And it took him 26 years to write, pretty crazy. As you might know, Wagner had some ideologies that weren't so great as a personal figure, but as a composer and a musician, he changed the course of history. His idea of the opera was to create a symphony that was off stage. You couldn't see them, but you had the actors on stage, theatrical, and you had maybe curtains and stuff like that, but you had a whole scene set up for these people like a visual scene maybe like a mountain scene or something and that's what the people are paying attention to so this totally changed the course of history because for the first time in history people walked into a opera into a room with the lights very dim and they didn't see the orchestra and they just saw a stage with all these props and they wondered what was going on and in some sense if you think about it this was creating the very first theater the very first cinema leading towards the very first basically what we have is movie and common tv today to where you're sitting back and getting entertained by something so wagner we can thank for this idea of the modern modern television modern movies and stuff like that modern entertainment basically on a screen okay and even plays and stuff like that so i'm kind of getting into actually watching that symphony reading the subtitles what it meant to me and it was basically click in my brain something changed and i realized that here's what i wrote down watching a well-known opera with subtitles you can understand what they are saying and it connects you to why they're singing the way that they are topics of love life death suffering greed and more are common topics of opera and that can be very dramatic it's different when you understand what they're saying so when they're talking about someone dying and someone cheating and someone something horrible happening it's going to be a very dramatic moment of singing that. And if you don't hear what they're saying, you're just going to hear that dramatic singer belting out their voice in this agony, and you're not going to understand why. So that's why I think it's good to watch an opera and read the subtitles. This leads me into Mahler's music. Okay, I have been touched by Mahler's music. It is just profound. I think that a way to really, really appreciate Mahler's music, in all honesty, is go through the course of, from Baroque music, Bach and Vivaldi and stuff like that, maybe even some before in the Renaissance, I don't think you really need to do that, but then to the classical, that's probably one of the most important, go through Mozart and Beethoven, and start to go into Romantic and your Tchaikovsky, and, you know, all those different composers, there's so many, I don't want to say too many, but go through your whole periods of Baroque, classical, romantic, post-romantic, and, you know, and you'll, I think with that, understand Mahler's music so much more. And then also listening to some operas too, because Mahler's music basically takes classical music, romantic music, and operas, and combines them into something that's just profound. He also takes Germanic 
influenced music, Russian influenced music, and many more cultures and weaves them into the sound of expressive of the what many will say the universe. I actually have something written down about Mahler I'm gonna bring up real quick. So here's something I wrote about Mahler. So I said, Mahler was one of the greatest opera conductors of all time. He used this vast knowledge and experience of some of the greatest operas as well as some mediocre operas at the time to be able to have an incredible amount of experience and tools to be able to use when coming up with his pieces. His symphonic pieces encompass works of many composers, many times leading you up to cliche moments and then completely surprising you, whether that is a dramatic and even operatic moment or other times silence and peace, with periods of everything in between and things you would never even imagine. Mahler's music embraces what many would describe as everything from the earth and nature with all of its good and evil, beautiful and ugly, as well as beyond to the universe of the unknown and mystic. Many times when listening to his pieces, you are not sure what is going to happen next, and many times you're not even sure how you got to where you are at the current moment. So many things are changing, but they happen in such a way that they make sense, and they work so well to the ear that sometimes you have to look back and realize how much the music has changed. Okay, so obviously if I wrote all that, it's very profound and changing to me. And I don't know if there's any other music that I've heard that has such a wide variety of so many influences all put together into basically all of his, all of his symphonies. His symphonies are basically that. That ties me into something really interesting, and that's relating music to life, math, and science. And interesting enough, Einstein did the same thing. It's not as well known that Einstein was a musician, and it may be less known that he was also a violinist. But here is an article by The Conversation. It's called Good Vibrations, The Role of Music in Einstein's Thinking, published February 14th, 2016, and it is by Robert and Talibat Trudeau. Okay, so I'm just going to quote the article here. As we marvel at scientists' latest extraordinary breakthrough, it's also an opportunity to ponder what kind of thinker Albert Einstein was. Born two decades before the beginning of the 20th century, what kind of mind was his that could come up with ideas that would have to wait until the second decade of the 21st century to be proven correctly? The man responsible for predicting the existence of gravitational waves as the last brick in his theory of general relativity is so often reduced to a tongue-poking electric hair shock caricature, the slight mad but cuddly genius who's just different to everybody else. That was a lot of words that kind of just made this person try to seem smarter than they were, I think, but let's just forget about that and try to get to the point of this article. The true picture is perhaps less colorful. Einstein was the product of a well-rounded education that importantly very much included the arts and humanities. It's little known that Einstein was an accomplished violinist, and even less known that if he had not pursued science, he said that he would have been a musician. A quote from Einstein, he says, I live in my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music. Looking at the role of music in Einstein's thinking sheds some light on how he shaped most of his profound scientific ideas. His example suggests that in being intimately involved with the scientific complexity of music, he was able to bring a uniquely aesthetic quality to his theories. He wanted his science to be unified, harmonious, expressed simply, and to convey a sense of beauty of form. He confessed to thinking about science in terms of images and intuitions, often drawn directly from his experiences as a musician, only later converting these into logic, words, and mathematics. Further down in the article, it talks about how Einstein's second wife, Elsa, told the story of him one day appearing totally lost in thought, wandering to the piano and playing for half an hour while intermittently jotting down notes. Disappearing into a room for two weeks, emerging for the odd piano session, then he resurfaced with a working draft of the theory of relativity. Of course, the piano playing and the theory of general relativity are not related to any direct or tangible sense. On one level, the story suggests that for Einstein, piano playing had the same effect as walking for many people, but there were deeper levels to the science-music relationship in Einstein's mind. There's some evidence that music played a role in the very shaping of his most important scientific discoveries. To understand how, it's important to know something about Einstein's musical background, as well as his two favorite creators of music, the composers J.S. Bach 
and W.A. Mozart. Then it goes into his violin lessons and talks about how Einstein was an accomplished violin player and it was a celebrated aspect of his public persona in his youthful days. Okay, so now I'm actually going to have Mahler's Fourth Symphony playing in the background while I talk about some more stuff. And an interesting fact is that Mahler was writing some of his symphonies while Einstein was coming up with the theory of relativity, while at the same time Sigmund Freud was also establishing psychology. So I'm actually keep that where it is. And I have a few things to show you. The major scale key, minor scale key, okay. And if you can pause this if you want, but this will all be linked in the description, uh, PDF downloadable files from my Google Drive. And here's an example of the filled in minor scale. You can see where there's parentheses that differentiate where you're going to fill in your raised seventh and maybe your raised sixth and seventh. Okay. Which will also change the chords. As you can see in the blue parentheses shows you the harmonic minor chords. I could do a separate video about that. Chord inversions for triads and chord inversions for seventh chords are all things that I'm going to be using uh, as knowledge to help me go through this. Maybe not so much inversions, but that's something good to know. So I'm going to link that all in the description for you. For me, I have on a piece of paper written down the scales that I might be using. I have D major. I have the triad inversions, the seventh chord inversions. I have the same thing where I highlighted the let's say C a certain color and it all stayed the same color throughout it whether it's seventh chords or triads and you know E is the same color blah 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 so you can see where those notes that are in the chord are positioned in the inversions okay so just good stuff that's what's gonna help me I have my handy dandy paper I'm looking at so just for you to help you if you want you can download those in the description okay so now getting to filling in the cantus firmus. I'm going to be filling this in using a florid counterpoint approach. So I'm going to want to shoot for suspensions, basically. That's the whole idea, is I'm going to be thinking in a fourth species basis. The basis to this will be suspensions, because fourth species counterpoint is the suspension. It's also taught that the 7-6 suspension is one of the best suspensions that we can do. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's first analyze the cantus that we're going to be working with. We see we're in D major. We can see the cantus goes up a third and to the and then goes up a step and another step. So if you're thinking about the D major chord, we can see that it's highlighting the one of the chord, the three, it's passing between the four and then the five, going back down to the three, and then it goes up to the six, five, three. Okay, you see four three, two, one. Okay. So we kind of analyze what's going on there and we see that it's a typical cantus firmus to where it's highlighting the root position tonic chord of the key that we're working in. Okay. So it's highlighting D major root position one, three, five has some passing notes. It goes up the six, but then it goes back down. So it plays a little interest, but that's basically the idea of the cantus firmus. So what can we do to add notes to make this underlying melody interesting? Okay, and also this underlying melody is just kind of highlighting the triad of the tonic chord. What can we do to change up the harmony? Imply some different chords and stuff on top of this underlying basis that is very simple. Okay, so it's good to always do your ending or your beginning, whatever you want to do. I'm going to start on my ending. So I'm going to do a whole note because it's oftentimes that in these counterpoint exercises, you're going to end on the value of the note you're working against. So I'm working against whole notes. So I'm going to end on a whole note. Okay. My given melody is whole notes in other words. So I see that I have a D. So in other words, if I do a D, I'll have an octave. That's the only time that I'll skip to the next one. Whenever you add that last note, it skips over to the side. Kind of funny. So here I go, I fix that. Sometimes if I press play to it'll mess it up. This time it didn't. Very good, everything's looking good. Um, and then it's well known that you often want a 7-6 suspension. Okay, so if we think backwards from here, is one easy way to do this. 
Oh. And actually, looking at this, I need to change everything here to different voices. So now I'm going to change this to voice 2. So then voice 1 will now be empty. And now I can pick and choose which measure I want to fill in notes. And I won't have to be in the same voice. Okay? And I can also choose different values of notes. And it won't affect anything on the same staff. With the Muse score at least. Okay? So like I was saying, working backwards can be one thing. So that's an easy way to figure out what your 7 6 suspensions gonna be just like that I'm gonna tie these two together I'm gonna make sure that this creates see I showed you totally wrong that's so funny that's what I should have done I should have gone down in the back of I forgot it's seven six suspensions go seven six and then eight of course so that's an easy way just to do it without thinking about it and then double checking the fact that this should be a six you can see it's a six but we can also see that it's the note F, and it's also the note D. So D, F would be a third, so that makes sense that it's a sixth. And then we can also see that we have the note E, and we have the note F. So think about an E chord, uh, E, G, B, D. I said F, I meant D. Whatever, okay. I was thinking I was going to redo this because I made a mistake, but you're with me. This is a less serious video. Okay, so I have a D right there, and I'm reading a bunch of treble and bass staff a bunch, so sorry if I mix it up a little bit. I've been working a bunch in the bass staff lately. So here we go. We have that 7-6 suspension, and now I'm going to write down the fingerings here. So you can do Control shift f in Muse score. And then that will give you the ability to write down your fingerings, which you can use to write down your intervals if you want. And then you can also click on something and then press shift and click on something else and it'll highlight uh, everything in between that basically. So I highlighted all that by clicking six, shift, clicking eight, highlights all of it. Dragged it down to where I wanted it. Okay, and then my seven, six suspension, I like to line both of those up. I like to add another fingering and then do a little underscore and then add that in between so now I can visually see I have my 7-6 suspension. Okay, now to start off with the beginning note, I'm going to start in the upper voice there. I'm gonna do some half notes, just as placeholders, and I'm gonna see that I'm starting on D, so I'm gonna put two Ds, because I'm not sure if I wanna start there, or, you know, actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an A and a D, okay? So we can see that I have the ability to, maybe I'll do a fifth, maybe I'll do the octave. I'm not sure yet, but I'll leave those there for now. Okay, the other thing to consider is we're writing above. So oftentimes when you're writing above, you'll go for a high point. Oftentimes when writing below, you're going to go for a low point. Okay, so we are writing above, and let's see if it would make sense to do a high point. So if we start approaching... And maybe if, maybe if we're already up above and we start to do contrary motion, let's say we go down to this area. Okay, let's say we do a high point. And I can see that if I did a high point, that that would work pretty well in this case. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you want to do a high point and it actually works better to do a low point when you're riding above, depending on how the given melody is. Uh, that's not typical, but that can happen. Okay? So it looks like a high point would be a good decision. The other thing to keep in mind is that your high point should be multiple things. It should be a melodic leap away from your tonic or a melodic interval away from your tonic. Uh, generally a leap would be good. Or the other thing is it could be your tonic note or your note that is your fifth degree of the scale that you're using. Those would be two very stable scale degrees and it'd be very good choices to use as the note for your high point. Okay, so with all that, Thinking about that, probably the best choice would then be chord five for a high point. Thinking about that, kind of a simplistic way, uh, very basic foundational thinking. Okay? So now we can analyze and we can think that, okay, so we are writing above what looks like an alto range. So we're writing the soprano range. With that, top three voices, you only want them to be an octave apart from each other. You can only have, you only want to have more than an octave 
when you have your bass to your tenor, okay? So we don't have that, we're doing our alto to soprano, so we want to stay within an octave, so in thinking of that, the largest interval is going to be an octave. So in other words, if I want to create a high point, a good idea is thinking about, well, if I do an octave above any of these notes, what am I going to get? Okay, so let's just simply see the fact that I have a B, so let's add a B here, and then let's see that I have an A here, so let's add an A here, and these are some of the highest notes in the melody, and I mean, I could also do the same thing here, do I have an A and I have an A, so let's see what we're working with. You know, maybe actually where I do see this B, that is the high point of the given melody, so that's probably not the best choice. If I did it in the same measure, not in the same beat, that is a possibility if I don't have any other options, so I guess I'll just leave that as a placeholder there. But I see my other two options for high points are my A and my A, or if I want to go a little bit lower than that, and I want to go here where I see my G, I could possibly even do a G, but you can see to where that's not incredibly uh, too much higher than anything else. I would probably have to stay low if I wanted to consider that. Okay, so let's consider the notes that we're using. Since we're in D major, if I did use A, that would be my fifth scale degree. So that's almost perfect right there. That almost writes itself. We can think of the other options. I have G. You probably don't want G. G is going to be scale degree four. That is good, and that kind of works, but that's not a... Um, a constant leap away from the tonic, so that kind of defeats that right there and contradicts it a bit. It's a good scale degree using as four, but then we can also see that if we used B, then we'd be scale degree six. So I think if I use scale degree five, that'd probably be my best choice. The question is, which area am I going to use scale degree five at? I can either use it in this measure or this measure, and I can see that my high point occurs here. So if I have a high point, and then my other high point occurs right after it, that could be interesting, but it might be more interesting if I did my high point here, and then also had, and then I came down from it here, so then in my given melody, I have a high point two measures after that, okay? That's probably gonna add some more interest, but let's look at what is after the note. We have the same exact scenario coming after the note. So no matter what we choose, it's gonna be the same deal going away from it. Now let's look before it. We can see that we have a B here and it goes down a step. Okay, but we can see before this other A that we have a G and it goes up a step. Okay, so that's already a third difference, the note that's before. With that we can see that this would actually enable us to do more of a leap if we chose this one here and then we'd also be two measures before where the given melody leaps. So that seems like a pretty good choice to me. So if I want to do a leap, I think that I'd probably shoot for somewhere of uh, a third somewhere in this measure. And you know, because of that, I'm actually going to write two thirds that are half notes as placeholders because I'm not sure if I want that third to just be in the beginning. And then if I want to go back to there, I probably want it to be at the end. So I'm going to at least put that third at the end because that's the leap. Let's see what kind of leap we have there. We see a leap of a seventh, so that doesn't work. Okay, so you don't want the leap of a seventh. So what could we do instead of having a third? Well, we can see that if we have a fifth, now we only have the leap of a fifth. It's still a good leap. If we did a sixth, or then we'd have a leap of a fourth. Probably don't want that. So it looks like this would probably be one of our best bets when we're thinking about how can we approach this? How can we leap to it? We can see that we're creating a fifth and then we're leaping up to an octave though. So that's direct motion from a perfect interval to another perfect interval. So you want to avoid that for sure. Okay, so we got to think about what we can do here. There's many ideas of what we can do here. But one idea could simply be creating a sixth and going up a fourth. It's not the biggest leap, but at the same time, we're not creating those direct motion to perfect intervals which can hinder our voice leading and I think it'd be better for voice leading if we just went up a fourth versus a fifth versus had direct motion to parallel intervals. I think we could all agree on this. The only thing is that this is going to alter the harmony. If we have a one, three, and then a six, now we're hinting at a first inversion chord by the time 
that we hit that sixth. So if we think about that, we could think that that would be our harmony center once we get to it. So our harmony center would be the E. So that would be a second, uh, basically a first inversion diminishes. Uh, what am I thinking? I'm not a minor. That would just be a, a minor two chord. Okay. A second inversion minor, uh, minor two chord. I've been doing a minor for a while with these exercises. So for a second, I was thinking two would be a diminished second, and then I, oh geez, I'm in major right now. Never mind. So I like to write down the intervals that I jotted down just to get an idea. So a three and a six. Oops, one of those was not in the right place. Okay. Third and six. So we can see that second inversion chord that's being hinted and it's the two going to the five could work with that it's going up a fourth to the high point I would like my high point then to go down so let's just for now make this a half note and because I do want some stability once I get it to my high point okay but I also want to go down from my high point okay and I also do want to create suspensions so there's some other things here is that what happens if I let's do this I'll keep my sixth okay but just for looks just to see what would happen and this is kind of me thinking like showing you what I would be going through my mind if I'm looking at I'd normally do this on a piece of paper so it's normally me on a piece of paper I'm doing it like I'm on the computer so I would think about okay I'd probably just like write these down lightly so I could erase it if I wanted to and think what happens if I suspend this note okay because you can just think about all in your head but it's <laughs> why not just write it down okay so we can look at it okay so here we can see that I have a sixth here so I'd have an octave if I went up another third so we can already see that we're going up to a ninth if I suspended that so I probably don't want to suspend that and I know it's it's good to go off the basis of suspending everything uh, in these exercises but also we want to create some interest, we want to create a high point, we want to do some things. So with that, don't get too trapped in having to create suspensions if you're going to break it to create something like a high point that has a good scale degree and a good recovery and approach to the high point as well. Because these are very important things if you want to also create your voice leading independence and be able to hear that contrapuntal melody stick out well. So now I'm going to do quarter notes on beat three and four and see what happens if I just go down steps. So obviously, obviously I'd have an octave, I'd have an eight, and I'd have a seven, and then I'd have a sixth. Okay, so that also would possibly change the harmony unless if my note after this keeps going down steps, because then that could just seem like the melody is just kind of going down steps to where it is. We can see that would create a seventh, so that's not a good idea there. Okay, we can also see what happens if I recover this and then suspend it? That might be a good idea. And let's see what happens. So I'll change this to that half note. Okay. I'll suspend this. Oops. And we can see that, okay, well, now we created a ninth. <laughs> so that's not good. And to think about the notes, we have an F and we have a G. So it's like a compound second, as you can see. Um, definitely not that. But what else could we do? What else could we do? So it looks like maybe suspensions for a few measures uh, may not be the best idea, but they also could be. Who knows? Let's think about some things. What happens if I go one step down from that? Well. That would be an eighth. That should be an octave because if I had a ninth before. So let's look. I have an F and I have an F. So I have an octave there, but I'd be going from an octave in one measure to an octave in another measure. It's not really something that you'd shoot for. Okay. So scratch that. Don't really want that. What happens if I start to do something kind of interesting here? And instead say, you know, maybe this is an eighth note on beat three here and we go off two eighth notes okay maybe I have some more eighth notes okay 
You know what? Maybe I'll make this non eighth note. Okay. So now I have a sixth instead. Okay. And that would that could work. So now I see that I'm recovering down from my octave. So I have an eight. And then I'll just label these seven, six, and then we'd have a five. Okay, and you can see the fifth, and just to read the notes, we have an A and an E. I love double checking, because sometimes I double check and I go, oh my gosh, <laughs> there's an accident. Uh, it's funny how it mumble jumbles everything up, I try to make it at least somewhat readable. Okay, there we can read. The intervals that I'm working with that I'm trying to work with at the moment we can see that I don't have the most suspensions at the moment so let's go for some more suspensions okay what happens if I take my octave and I suspend it here okay we can already probably see what's gonna happen there Should get into writing mode okay so we suspend that we can also see another seven six suspension coming right here and 7-6 suspension, maybe not something that you want to shoot for all the time. What if we could do something else? Okay, so we also saw that we could have the octave there, and we could also have the fifth. So what happens if we change this to a fifth, and we ended up suspending it? Well, we can see that that would just create a three suspension. So that's interesting. But you know what? Why not do what I was saying from the beginning? And go from the octave, and then suspend that. And let's see, I have a D, and I have a D, so be suspending that. Oh, it does create a sixth, never mind. So if I suspend it, it creates a sixth. So no matter what, it's creating a consonant suspension. So with that knowledge, you know, maybe I just will actually do my fifth. I'll bring this down to where my fifth is. And then I will suspend that again over in the next measure. You gotta click the correct voice you wanna work with. And then that'll create a third. So that's kinda interesting there. And how's the how's the third going to respond? How am I, oh, I guess I just gotta highlight it like this. So now I can tie I can tie these together. And we can see that there's a just a note difference in between these two notes here. So what are we going to do in between those two notes? There's multiple things we could do. And we can see that it is leading up towards my leap. I already have the third up here. So, you know, maybe I want to start somewhere on my fifth and with a quarter note and then lead back down with another quarter note and do a fourth, which leads me in stepwise motion so it's following what you want to do for a passing tone to where I have that passing tone on beat four leading to the next measure okay so let's write down what I did uh, for now yeah we'll just write it down for now three I'm gonna add some more though I went to three I went five I went four okay so we know that we can do some things we can add some eighth note fillers if we want if we see the gap of a fourth then I could change this first note to a quarter note and I could do two eighth notes to fill in that gap going up. I could also embellish my uh, suspension if I want to by doing two eighth notes that are either coming above the suspension and going back to the same note or go below and then back up to the same note. So it looks like in this case, I have that gap of the fourth. So why not use the eighth note fill method? and just do some eighth notes filling in that gap. So that leads up to there, which then goes back down, leading me towards starting to go to my high point. Okay, so we can see an established suspension from the beginning. We can also see I started on a fifth. Do I wanna start an octave and go down to the fifth? Or I could just simply, some good just think simply, make this a half note rest. So that helps with the voice leading to where as the first note comes in, you have beats one and two with the given melody, and then on beat three, you have the counterpoint. So it's very obviously that there's a different contrapuntal melody randomly starting, not at the same time. I wouldn't say random, but starting not at the same time, okay? 
Okay, so we can see I created a beginning, I created a high point, I created a recovery to the high point. I have a moment in the middle that has some kind of boring notes that I probably am going to change around. But before I get there, it's always good to lead up to the ending, fill in some other gaps as well. And I see that it, it did something interesting here. It took the last three measures and put them on the bottom. In this case, you can highlight everything and you can press control and then you can press the bracket that goes to the left. And if that doesn't work, you can go into format while everything is highlighted, stretch, and then do decrease stretch layout. And again, you need to manually do it every time for some reason. You need to keep going into format, stretch, decrease. It'll go away once you click it. You do it, keep doing it. And after a while, sorry this is taking some time, it'll make everything back on that same line again. Should. And it looks as if it's maybe not. So, well, I tried what I could do. It's going to put the very last note in the last measure. That's not that big of a deal. Okay, it's, it's whatever. We can work with it. Okay. So now we're looking at everything else. Uh, I see that this was my possible high point here. And I got rid of it though. But maybe I'll keep it. It's often taught that you are not going to strive for more than one high point in your given melody. But if you look at some of examples such as people like Mozart, which are very historical, you can see that in some of Mozart's examples, at least one of them I've seen, he did a double high point, okay, where he leapt up to them twice and then recovered them twice in just one given melody. So there's that consideration. So maybe I'll leave that A there just for now to consider it, okay, but that's about it. The other thing is my ending. How am I going to get to my ending? And not only that, how am I going to get from this recovery of the high point to a point that leads me throughout this whole gap to the ending. So in that case, I probably want to focus on how I'm going to get to my ending first. Okay. I'm going to take a one minute break and I'll be right back. Oh, you probably missed everything I was saying. So, I had my mic turned off, and what I was saying, that's so funny. I'm wearing an ELO shirt. So now you're wondering what I was doing. Okay, ELO, wearing an ELO shirt. I saw them live, I got this. It was Jeff Lynn's ELO uh, from where I saw this, but uh, it was much bigger of a band before. Jeff Lynn was the co-founder, along with Roy something, who created the band Wizard. If you look it up, you'll see. He has a song uh, on the band wizard, like when my baby jives or something. Got to look it up. So now you can see all the things that I was saying. Now you know why I was doing those gestures and stuff. Okay, it all makes sense now. This is what I was talking about. We're going to get back into it. And we're going to keep filling this out. Okay, so again, fourth species basis. I didn't do some suspensions in some areas. And, you know... That's just what I'm doing. So I'm kind of having a little freedom here, let's say. Okay, so let's try to strive for some more suspensions. And let's also strive for some things here. It's good to have a slower beginning, which I do have a two eighth notes in my beginning. I don't find that a big deal. But it's good to have a slower sort of beginning. And then 
a good pace leading you up to your high point and a pause at your high point and sort of a little bit of an acceleration from your high point going down. So I kind of want an acceleration of my high point going down and I also from there near the ending of this whole thing kind of want a slow point finishing everything. I already have my 7.6 suspension so that's already pretty slow right there. That might be good enough with that suspension half note and then whole note finish. But you know, let's keep those in mind. Let's keep filling it out. What else could we do? Okay, so again, I like to work backwards a lot and sometimes it's not easy to work backwards on mu score because you can't fill in the last note in the measure. But you can figure out how to do that in other methods. Okay, so let's think working backwards. Uh, I see some contrary motion here. So let's just start filling in some notes and seeing what we get. I'm gonna start filling in some quarter notes in contrary motion and seeing where I end up. Okay, so it looks like it ended up on an octave there. And then I could see where I probably wouldn't wanna do an octave there depending on what's happening uh, in the next measure. But that wouldn't, that wouldn't really be a big deal at all. I could do an octave there goes to a seventh. This is just going up there. I, this is obviously not what I want to do, but I'm thinking, so what am I going to highlight in this measure here? And if I already go up high, that might be good. I'm up high and then I go back down, but it might be better to actually start a little lower here. And if I'm thinking I have a sixth and that's being suspended, if I do a three and a sixth, then I have my first inversion chord and I could see that the harmony would be on D which would be my tonic which would be good towards leading me towards the ending so you know I think I might want to do something like that and instead of this just going up stepwise maybe I'll do something different to where hmm what if I created a fourth here what if I created a half note here of the same note and suspended it? That would have to get recovered on beat three though, so that wouldn't work. But a suspension of some sort would be good. That's kind of boring if I did that. I'm just thinking of the suspension options that I could have. I obviously wouldn't start from a fourth basis. And if I do a three and a four, well, that's going to want to resolve. So what to do is the question. Well, I think in this case, I know this might seem boring, but I, I really think st staying simple a lot of times gives a very good result, okay? So we can see here that I actually created a sixth, I go down to a fifth, I go back up to my sixth again, and it's all highlighting the same note for basically two measures spread out through three different measures. Okay. Is it something that you're going to want? I don't know, but this is my ending. So this is the D and it's all highlighting D and then it finishes on D. So I actually like this because it's really highlighting that D note and it's kind of slowing down. It's creeping up here. We have a suspension, go down a bit, staying up here, go down a bit, staying up there. That's in my eyes, a very slow ending. And I also see that it's going up so actually I'm thinking that again for a little placeholder in this measure I'm gonna add a third right now and I think six yes yeah, six is half notes so if you're on muse score and you press different numbers as you can see it'll change if I do seven oh seven is whole note six is half five is quarter four is eighth and then you know three sixteenth keeps going down from there so it's good to know okay so I see if I have a third there, that's just a step difference. So, oops, I pressed F. So maybe in that case, maybe I actually want to end on the third so then I can 
go up and finish going up okay so keeping that in mind I also see there's that possible high point there which I'm actually gonna get rid of because I don't want that to get in the way of my thinking here we can see what note are we working with before we get to this next measure which we can see is going to be implying a G chord okay which if we look at G that's chord 4 so it's good things to keep in mind here and we see that if we had the F before that then we'd have chord 3 so chord 3 to chord 4 I mean that is not bad there and we could definitely work with that so maybe at that point I'll just simply want to highlight my root position I'll leave those there for now and keep those as placeholders okay so again I'm gonna label those five and three underneath the root because I didn't label these I like labeling stuff so three four and five there we go label that didn't label this so label this now six five six very good okay and now I kind of just want to focus on this gap here in the middle I can see that the given melody leaps up again so again I'm gonna put another placeholder of a third here I don't really want to go much higher than that in this measure because we can see that already if I had a fifth I'm already a third away from my high point okay so in that case I might actually want to keep that pretty low in that measure let's see what's gonna happen okay so where we're leading to from the high point we can see we have this note here and I'll just add another half note at this point and I want to be somewhere around this area for this measure so it looks like a good point to add a suspension for me the only question is what am I gonna do in this measure I'll just keep this I'm not gonna keep all those the same note believe me that's just uh, the idea of suspending that middle note there and what I'm gonna do to work with this okay and of course with a consonant suspension I can go where any wherever I want after it. I don't have to resolve it a down a step so what am I gonna do with this measure well again let's look at where I'm surrounded by I'm surrounded by where it'd be a third is going to the next measure and we can see that's just a step down from where the suspended note is in this measure okay so we can already see another suspension being made right there again it's good to work in that fourth species basis try to do suspensions but then again I don't want to be too trapped in that and think oh my gosh only suspensions and then going from the suspension basis and trying to do stuff I'm gonna use that as advice and I'm gonna try to strive towards that and if it doesn't seem like it really works all that well and there's something I might do that might be better then I'm gonna choose what might be better did something change there no okay cool so let's look at this and see what I'm working with here obviously I have a bunch of thirds here obviously that three is being suspended and I want to keep that so I'll actually write what I'm trying to keep written down for now I can see did that shift too much nah, good enough okay did I really write six and fifth no, third okay so we see the sixth we see an F and we see a D I think DF is the third and we also see that we have a B and a D okay now the question is what am I gonna do from here you can see a passing tone you wouldn't you wouldn't suspend a dissonance so we're not gonna be suspending that I already have that next note suspended there what if I bring this up to a fifth 
and suspend this note? No. What if I bring this up to a fifth and suspend this? If I can see a sixth, so that actually it works. I could do that. And the question is, how do I get up there? Well, I see a third difference. So that's pretty easy there. I'm going to change that to a quarter note. I'm going to go into eighth note mode. And now I'm going to add two eighth notes. Oh, I see. I was like, what's going on metrically? I thought I made a mistake. It changed that to an eighth note. I see. Okay. So now I'm going to change to eighth note mode. <laughs> and I'm going to go up. What am I thinking? Yeah, this is beat two. I only need a quarter note. So yeah, I am making mistakes. Look at me. Oof. Woo. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of dumb. So as we can see, uh, all that I did was change this into a lesser value of one. So then I could add that note in the middle. If you want to fill in the span of a third, obviously you only need one note in the middle of it. I don't really know what I was thinking there. I was. I've been so much in the basis of filling in spans of a fourth with eighth notes. I think I was just not thinking so much and kind of going off that thought process. Okay, so there we have three, four, and five. We had just stepwise motion, a root position triad. We can see a lot of root positions and first inversion chords because basically that's what we're going to be doing in these exercises. We're going to be hinting the... I didn't explain this, but if you notice, if above your given melody, if you write a three, five, or octave, okay, you're going to be creating the same... You're going to be highlighting the harmony to where your bass note is the harmony center with all those three five and octave okay but then if you do a sixth now your harmony center is that sixth note your upper note is now your harmony center versus your bass note so basically in all these cases three five and octave which you're, you're going to be choosing as your consonant intervals for your strong beats versus using a sixth which is your other one uh, those are your options. So you're either going to be creating a root position triad or you're going to be creating a second or first inversion triad. And there are some rules and other things you can do once you get further into this. And for one example, if you're writing below, you can start on your root and you can have a third above that in your given melody. And you can then go from your counterpoint, which is below, down a fourth, which will then create a six, four or four, six second inversion triad so there's just that just if you didn't know that now you know that uh but let's get back into filling this out so i added some more suspensions as you can see here and it'd be good to even add some more suspensions so in this case what happens if i see my five is here my five is already being suspended that works is there anything else i can maybe suspend If I suspend this five, but then on the downbeats that has, maybe not. I don't like to have underlying issues in the in the uh, downbeats because then that means if you reduce everything to not being suspended, I would have some parallel intervals, parallel fifths happening there. I want to avoid underlying problems like that. So I can simply see that I have the span of a fourth here I could fill in that gap, but before that, I'm trying to think of suspending this measure here. What could I do to create a suspension in this measure? Well, if I do a fourth and a fifth again, almost would work out really well, but then I need to recover the fourth, and I'm already suspending the three of that measure, so that doesn't really work very well. I could create a chain of some suspensions, but I'm also trying to go by actually filling out this with uh, melodic fluency as well. So that's kind of one of the biggest goals here. I guess for now while I'm thinking about this, I'll just change these into the eighth notes and do the eighth note fill. Add some stepwise motion from there. Okay, so we can see this all coming together pretty well. The main thing is I just kind of want to figure out how to add maybe some more suspensions in here. The leap up to the high point, I don't really think I need to suspend that. If I could suspend something in the measure here, that would be good. But as I can see, I'm already using 
Well, let's see. I'll change this into a quarter note. I'll add another quarter note. So now I have those sixths. And I could uh, use my sixth as my last note that then leaps up to the high point. And with that, I could change beat three into something else, possibly. It could possibly possibly be a recovery of something. But then again, it's what is that going to be recovering? Because beat four is already going to be going up there. So it looks like already, maybe not the best idea. This is an interesting one. I do kind of want to create a sort of slower beginning. Trying to figure out exactly what I could do. I do see another span of a fourth. I could just do two eighth notes again. Two eighth note fills again. That does seem rather boring. Because I already did that before. Twice. With eighth note fills. Filling in the span of a fourth. Three times if I'm actually looking at it right now. So that's kind of redundant at that point. What if I'm trying to think of interesting melodic here because I have done dun 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 dun. might be interesting enough for me honestly how it is you can't actually hear it so I can just play it and I can hear it I like that actually I was thinking that kind of seems good enough how it is right there like I said I'm, I'm simple I a lot of times shoot for simplicity and when I don't do that it doesn't turn out the same so shooting for simplicity again Okay, we can see we have a sort of slow beginning. We go up to the high point. We have a sort of pause. We're going down a little bit faster from there. I would like to keep with that whole idea of going down kind of faster from there. I could change this into a quarter note. And then I could do an eighth note embellishment of this suspension. Or I could either do that, or I could do that. But then again, I don't want to be creating too many moments to where there's one note being suspended throughout a whole measure since I already have that a good amount. So what else could I do to add some more interest here? And I kind of do just want to go stepwise motion down, honestly. So maybe it would just be better like this, in all honesty, just simply. So let me see what this sound like to me. Okay. What else could I do? I think it'd be interesting just to add some stuff. So instead of having everything symmetric as it is, let's add just a few things to spice it up just a little bit. Add a dotted 
quarter note there with an eighth note in between it. Okay, and it's, I guess, just keeping everything how it is right there. So in all honesty, that looks pretty good to me. I could add some filler notes in the last measure, but I kind of do just want to have that 7-6 suspension and that 6th suspension leading up to it, or the 6 being suspended, creating the 7-6 suspension to the octave. I think it's good enough how it is. Okay. And I'll see exactly where I am in the symphony right now. Because you, we can hear there's some vocal going on right now. Which is one thing I'll sing adds a lot of depth to the symphony you're listening to. Oh, I've actually been listening for a lot longer than I thought. Okay. Oh, we have a while. We basically just started this. But I saw someone said the fourth symphony. His fourth is my most beloved and precisely its fourth movement within it also. Is what someone said in their picture is Beethoven. So it's pretty funny. So I don't really want to stop this in the middle of this to show you how this sounds, but I guess that's what we're going to have to do. There's a sort of resolved moment in the piece. It's waiting for that. So now I'll actually turn mu score volume back on and we can listen to the end result of this. Very simple. And actually, funny enough, there's a few things that I didn't really change in the middle there, but I kind of like it, how it's simple. I just have two uh, half notes here, and then I had those two repeating notes here, which I actually didn't mean to do. It's supposed to be a 3-4-5, and it was a 4-4-5, four, four, and it actually didn't sound that bad, which was funny. Uh, but there we go. So it's supposed to be a little different right there, but... Yeah. There you go, it's sounding a little more musical now with the counterpoint, where you can see where it's actually becoming a little bit more fugal sounding, sounding more like a fugue or something contrapuntal, and yeah, has more of a musical sense to it now with the florid counterpoint, and the suspensions allow us to create some interest in the melody, I guess I would say. Because it's interesting how one harmony suspends into the next measure to where it creates another harmony. So that's it for this video, basically. Filled in this Cantus Firmus. Talked about some interesting stuff. Look out for my next videos coming up. I'm going to have a possible review of the Florid Counterpoint response. I'll probably have that. I'll have some videos on like song forms. I have some coming up on the Sonata. And then I already did one on Sonata form. Check that out. I'm going to have some things on like the Scherzo and Minuet and Trio and random things you'll find in a sonata or sonata form actually that would be a sonata so look out for that cool stuff happening um i'm looking forward to actually teaching about the orchestra soon starting with the string section so i'm gonna have a video teaching about the string section it'll then go into teaching about the violin uh cello viola and double bass as well and the strings that they have where you can read that on the staff if you're looking at it, uh, along as then individually isolating each instrument, learning about the violin, learning about the viola, learning about the cello, double bass each separately, writing solo pieces for each of them, combining them, writing pieces, chamber music to where you combine them, maybe string quartets, trios, uh, and then also adding the piano, doing things like piano sonatas, and uh, maybe piano quintets and stuff like that which is the basis of a lot of uh, chamber music. You have a lot of chamber music there and the basis of a lot of how co our famous composers that we know of learned how to write some of their 
amazing symphonic works through practicing and stepping through the steps of learning how to write chamber music first. Some also went back and wrote later chamber music, some wrote chamber music later on after studying some stuff, but it's a general consensus that the chamber music uh, helps a composer learn topics that they can expand into the orchestra, okay? Very exciting stuff, soon to come, and if you like this video, thumbs it up. Let me know in the comments if you like this type of video, it's more relaxed, less editing, me filling in the cantus firmus, some music in the background. If you didn't like it, let me know, whatever, it's good enough. Uh, subscribe if you want to see more, there's going to be a whole lot coming out. If you hit that bell, you'll see every time that I upload a video, and you won't miss it. So until next time, goodbye, take care.